Okay, we're going to reconvene our meeting here. Uh, with the uh, Pledge of Allegiance, I'm going to ask the veterans in the audience if they'll lead us in the pledge, please. Thank you, veterans. We have uh, several proclamations here this evening. And I will bring these forward. Let's see, we have uh, uh, Jeff Noble, commander, and uh, Lance Corporal Wesley, Wesley G. Davis, American Legion, Post 800, and other veterans here. So if you'll join me at the podium. Rick, when we get to the uh, high school, you want to bring those up for me? Sure. Okay. Well, I have a proclamation here, and let me read this to you. Um, okay, whereas Veterans Day affords all citizens an opportunity to pause and reflect on the sacrifices of living veterans, the commemoration is formally known as Armistice Day, in recognition of the end of the war to end all wars, which was declared a national holiday in 1938 by congressional action to celebrate the service of World War I veterans in the most brutal, far-reaching war this nation had ever seen. And whereas following the honorable actions of veterans in World War II and the Korean War, Congress recognized the need to honor all those who have sacrificed for the common good, in 1954, President Eisenhower proclaimed November 11 as Veterans Day to publicly commemorate the contributions of every man and woman to wear our nation's uniform. And whereas there are nearly one million veterans in the state of Ohio and more than 23 million veterans across the 50 states who have preserved the peace domestically and throughout the world over decades of conflicts, America's veterans have selflessly fought for our country, defending the innocent, protecting the democratic ideals that we hold so dear, placing the security of our nation before their own safety, all the while facing the trauma and severe hardships of war. And whereas Americans can, can attribute their freedom to the love of country and willingness to serve of our veterans on Veterans Day, we in honor and acknowledge the legacy of these brave men and women who have earned our respect and admiration. And whereas the VFW Post 10691 and the Wesley G. Davids American Legion Post 800 invite veterans and their families to a breakfast hosted by La Chatelaine in historic Dublin, and a public ceremony to follow at the Grounds of Remembrance in Dublin's Veterans Park on Tuesday, November 11th, for a time of recognition and remembrance. Now, therefore, I, Michael H. Keenan, Mayor of the City of Dublin, on behalf of Dublin City Council, do hereby proclaim the week of November 9 through 15 as Veterans Week in the City of Dublin, urging all citizens to recognize the sacrifices made by veterans in preserving our freedoms and encouraging all citizens to display the U.S. flag and to participate in patriotic activities throughout the week. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your service. Thank you. Thank you Good. I'd like to say a few words? Sure. I uh, do want to remind you that next Tuesday, a uh, week from Tuesday, we do have Veterans Day. And we'll be around. Um, if you have family that are veterans in particular, Get them out to La Chatelaine, free breakfast, it's great. Uh, we have a ceremony over at the park uh, at 11 o'clock. It's very short and sweet. So uh, we do want to thank the city for recognizing us on this week and uh, hope to see you some next week. Thanks. Thank you so much, appreciate it. We hope to see everybody at the events on Veterans Day. It's, a, it's, a, it's an excellent program, and please, uh, 
please join us. Thank you. Okay, we have the Dublin Jerome High School girls golf team state champions, and I think we have Coach C.D. Butcher. You here? You want to bring uh, everyone forward? Do we want to do it out here, do you think? Yeah, why don't we come out here? Ladies? Well, welcome, ladies. It's quite an accomplishment. Uh, my daughter actually uh, played on the Kaufman team a number of years ago, and I got to tell you, um, she's now in the corporate world. But the game of golf is something you'll take with you your whole life, and she's using it in the corporate world. Uh, whereas many times, uh, ladies were left behind at the functions and the different things that were going on. She joins them and that golf game has really served her well and I know it will serve all of you. But um, what you have to be careful of is you don't want to beat the boss. And I know every one of you probably can. So I have this proclamation CD. Whereas the Dublin Jerome High School girls golf team captured their fourth consecutive Division I girls state championship in Ohio record on Saturday, October 18th, 2014 at the OSU Gray Course with a two-day combined score of 626, defeating contender Maslin Jackson, and whereas with a season record of 186 and 6, that's amazing, the team was undefeated in Ohio Capital Conference play. The team was the 2014 Ohio Capital Conference Cardinal Division League champions as well as sectional and central Ohio district champions, and whereas the hard work and individual efforts of each of the team members resulted in their success throughout the season, and at the state championship level, and whereas the young and talented members of the Celtics girls golf team include Sybil Robinson, raise your hand, thank you, um, Mai Arana, thank you, and Mariana Arana, Abby Kiefer, and Tabby Robinson. Whereas team members Sybil Robinson, Mai Arana were members of the team earning the four states titles. Senior Sybil Robinson was first team all Ohio, first team all Central Ohio, first team all OCC, and all academic Ohio. Senior Mai Arana was second team all Ohio, first team all Central Ohio, first team OCC, and all academic Ohio. Sophomore Mariana Arana was a member of the team for two state titles and earned honorable mention all Central Ohio, first team all OCC, Freshman Abby Kiefer was second team all Central Ohio and first team all OCC. And freshman Tabby Robinson was second team all Central Ohio and first team all OCC. It's pretty a lot of accomplishments there, ladies. Whereas the team is ably coached by head coach C.D. Butcher, who deserves recognition for the commitment to building an outstanding team, which again has achieved recognition at the state level. Now therefore I, Michael H. Keenan, mayor of the city of Dublin, Ohio, on behalf of Dublin City Council, to hereby proclaim Friday, November 7th, 2014, as Dublin Jerome High School Girls Golf Team Day in the city of Dublin, and extend our congratulations to the team and their coach on this outstanding achievement. Congratulations, Coach. Good job. Good plan. Rick, we have. Uh, we have something. Uh, we either had hats or we have these wonderful ball markers. Nobody else in the world has these, by the way. This is, uh, these are ball markers that include uh, recognition of Dublin's participation in the Solheim Cup, uh, President's Cup, the Ryder Cup, and of course we all have the Memorial Tournament each and every year, so very good. Thank you, ladies. Thank you, Coach. You know, keep up the good work. Okay, and we have one final presentation here. Tonight we're going to recognize Courtney D'Angelo for her third place 
uh, in the All-Ireland Dancing Championships of 2014. So, uh, Katie Regan, would, if you would come forward. Thank you. Katie Regan Donovan started Irish dancing at the age of five under the direction of the late Ann Richens, and, uh, a native of Dublin, Ireland. Katie's been dancing for 28 years. Uh, Katie is a five-time Midwest champion, placed second at the national championships and seventh in the world's championship held in Galway, Ireland. And you're going to say a few words about the uh, program, as I understand it. You want to do the podium? or? Thank you. Thank you very much for having us here this evening. Um, we are delighted and thrilled uh, to share this wonderful accomplishment, uh, Ms. Courtney D'Angelo, one of my students here, along with my partner, Nicole Rankin Lindsay, um, another one of the teachers with the Regan Rankin Academy. Uh, Courtney placed a third place in the All Ireland's Championship. This is an international world qualifying event um, that took place um, last weekend. And we are thrilled and honored for Courtney to represent the city of Dublin um, over in Dublin, Ireland. Um, it's an amazing accomplishment. We couldn't be uh, more proud of her. Um, so thank you very much uh, for having us. Thank you. Let me congratulate you. And I will present this proclamation. Now let me read this for the benefit of everyone here. Whereas Courtney D'Angelo of Dublin, Ohio, placed third at the All-Ireland Irish Dancing Championships held in Sagard, South County, Dublin, Ireland, from October 25th to 30th, 2015. And whereas, as a third place All-Ireland champion, based on her outstanding execution of a home pipe, a reel, a traditional set dance, and a non-traditional set dance, she was presented with an orange sash, a Baelic Irish frame, three medals, and a perpetual silver trophy. And whereas she has studied Irish dance since 2004 with Katie Regan Donovan of the Regan Rankin Academy of Irish Dance, Courtney is currently ranked third in the Midwest region, fifth in the nation, and now third at the All-Ireland Championships. And whereas Courtney was selected as one of approximately 70 cast members for Studio Two Stage, which includes dancers and musicians from Ireland, England, Australia, and the United States, and provides an opportunity to learn from world-renowned choreographers about touring in a show. And whereas Courtney is a frequent face on the promotions for the Dublin Irish Festival and has graced the stages of the festival for many years, she is very hardworking, and her dance teachers, family, and friends are extremely proud of her achievements. Now, therefore, I, Michael H. Keenan, Mayor of Dublin, on behalf of Dublin City Council, do hereby proclaim Saturday, November 8, 2014, as Courtney D'Angelo Day in the city of Dublin, congratulating her on the outstanding achievement in Irish dance at the All-Ireland Irish Dancing Championships and wishing her much success in the World Championships in 2015. Okay, would you like to say a few words? Um, I just want to say thank you to the city of Dublin for presenting me with this proclamation. And I'm just really happy that I can take my love of dance and show other people how much um, it means to me. And I'm just really proud that I can be able to represent the city of Dublin. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. then thank you to everybody that was exciting uh, this brings us to the uh, uh, portion of the of our uh, meeting agenda here uh, with respect to citizen comments we have a I believe it's Claire Pollard 
33 North 3rd Street. Are you here to speak? Please come forward. Good evening. Uh, we are here today on behalf of nearly 1,000 Central Ohio janitors and their families. These are members of SEIU Local 1. These are hardworking taxpayers who contribute to our local economy doing essential work. We know that you share our commitment to the economic development in our region and in communities like Dublin where many of our members live and work. Business in Central Ohio is on the upswing and the surge of new development projects in this area is evidence of the, pro of the progress. But despite the growth that corporate Columbus is enjoying, working families are finding it harder than ever to make ends meet. The Castro Real Estate Company is a prime example of a thriving Central Ohio corporation. As one of the largest retail property owners in the country, Castro affiliated companies have acquired a significant share of commercial real estate in and around Columbus, valued at over $41 million. These projects have received millions in state and local subsidies, taxpayer dollars that have funded their developments. But the janitors who clean Casto buildings um, do not share in this success. The cleaning company hired to clean several of Casto's properties pays janitors as little as $9,000 a year. Part-time low-wage jobs like these are the reason that the poverty rate in Central Ohio has nearly doubled over the past decade. It is because of this that we are concerned to hear that Casto has proposed a large residential development in Dublin's Bridge Street District and is pursuing uh, a TIF agreement with the City of Dublin to help fund the project. As members of the Dublin City Council, you can take the lead in making sure that corporations benefiting from public tax dollars act responsibly. We urge you to require as a condition of any project approval that Casto be committed to hiring responsible companies that provide quality jobs to all their employees. Furthermore, we urge you to deny Castro's request for public funding for their projects until the company commits to acting in the public interest by supporting the good jobs that Central Ohio needs. We welcome any questions you may have and look forward to discussing this matter with you further. And we have some materials to leave with you today. You can give those to the clerk and she'll disseminate okay. them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, that brings us to the consent agenda. Does any council member have any item they'd like to be removed? Hearing none, is there a motion to approve the actions for so the four items? Second. Thank you. Dan? Uh, Ms. Seeley? Yes. Mr. Lackleiter? Yes. Mr. Reiner? Yes. Mayor Keenan? Yes. Mr. Nisi Storker? Yes. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Vice Mayor Gerber? Uh, yes. With second readings, Ordinance 106-14. Establishing the name of a new road as un University Boulevard in the city of Dublin, Ohio. Mr. Hammersmith? Members of council, as you know, uh, Academic Drive started construction this summer, which is the 250-foot segment of roadway south of the roundabout at State Route 161 and Industrial Parkway. Uh, that construction continues and paving should happen uh, very soon. Uh, completion of that segment of roadway is May 15th. Recently, we had a request from the administration for the Ohio University Heritage College of Osteopathic Medicine to consider changing the name of the roadway to University Boulevard. Uh, staff reviewed this request, uh, finds no difficulties with this request, and we present to you this evening a resolution in support of that name change uh, and recommend approval this evening. Um, I do have an exhibit on the screen that shows the location of University Boulevard, and we'll be glad to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Paul. Any questions from Council? No. Uh, Ann? Uh, Mr. Nissi Zerker? Yes. Mr. Reiner? Yes. Mr. Lackleiter? Yes. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Vice Mayor Gerber? Yes. Ms. Saley? Yes. Mayor Keenan? Yes. Brings us to Resolution 87-14. Authorizing the City Manager to enter into a contribution agreement with the City of Columbus for the Sawmill Road Hard Road Intersection Improvements Part 2 project. I'll introduce it. Thank you. Mr. Hammersmith? Members of Council, before you this evening is a resolution for the contribution agreement, which is essentially the construction agreement for the Sawmill Hard Intersection Improvement Part 2, which we are working on jointly with the City of Columbus. Uh, we are upon that most joyous time, only second to the opening of the intersection, which is the construction of the intersection, and this agreement provides for that construction. Um, this has been a joint project with the City of Columbus. We are marrying up the intersection improvement with their last uh, portion of improvement of hard road. The projects will be bid together. Again, we expect efficiencies in doing so. And we will have Columbus do the inspection services and construction management for this project and pay them a percentage to do that. Uh, that percentage is based on 
the present estimate for the construction, uh, but will be based on the final bid once we open bids on the project. Thank you. Any council questions? Staff does recommend approval. Thank you. Ann? Vice Mayor Gerber? Uh, yes. Mr. Reiner? Yes. Ms. Saley? Yes. Mr. Peterson? Mr. Lechleiter? Yes. Mayor Keenan? Yes. Ms. Genesee Zerker? Yes. Resolution 8714 is uh, passed by 7 to 0 vote. Thank you. Uh, let's see. We have a presentation of the GPS oh. tracking system. Megan? We've got all kinds of new toys, it sounds like. We're trying, working on it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, council members. As you know, snow and ice removal operations are very visible. They affect all city residents, and it's an important city service. There's a lot of moving pieces and parts involved in managing snow events. There's procurement of salt and materials. There's tracking our resources, getting equipment ready, communicating to residents the status, and then communicating important messages to residents as well. We've provided several updates recently regarding our recent activities to get ready for snow and ice. Um, that includes our snow go day, paint the plow, things like that. But really, we have been preparing since last snow season. We've been working to create a brand new tool that we're excited about. Um, and tonight, we're here to give you a sneak peek into that tool. And this tool is really going to help, help us manage our snow operations moving into this season as well into future seasons. The tool is named Snow Go. Um, you can look at that, it might be Snow Go Away, I don't mm -hmm. know. Um, but it is named Snow Go, and this is the logo up on the screen that's been developed um, to brand the tool. So you'll see that on our website in the future. There's been a team of staff involved from several departments in developing this tool. Staff's been involved from Fleet, IT, GIS, community relations, as well as public service. So it really has been a team event, or a team effort. And it's been ongoing, like I said, since last snow season. So the Snow Go tool is a new web page that'll be on the city's website in time for this first snow event. It's not up there yet. We're wrapping up some of the details. Wanted to see if council had any input into the appearance or the text or anything like that tonight. So it's not live yet. Tonight I have screenshots. Um, another reason that we're doing screenshots is because it's not snowing outside that I'm aware of. So there really wouldn't be much to snow or much to snow, much to show in terms of activity. Um, so the screen would be rather boring. So we have a simulated event that we're showing you screenshots of. So what this means is that residents will be able to go to our website, obtain more snow and ice information than they ever have before. Um, on the left side of the screen, you can see that there's information regarding how we prioritize our snow removal efforts. The city does have a policy to remove snow and ice from curb to curb, which is a great policy. We prioritize all of our streets into three different categories. The first priority are streets that carry a lot of traffic at higher speeds. They're what you consider major roads. And there are arteries such as 33, Avery, Muirfield, Riverside, Dublin Road. On the map, you can see this is the citywide map. Those are the routes that are shown in green. So those are the priority one routes. After we complete the priority run one routes, then our crews proceed on to our priority two routes. And those are the routes that are shown in blue on the citywide map here. Priority two streets. Um, once those are completed, then we move on to priority three, and those are the streets that are shown in gold, and those are what we would call the residentials, the courts, the streets that most people would live on. So as snow season progresses and during snow events, we do get a lot of calls from residents asking questions about how we decide which streets to plow first, asking questions about why we haven't gotten to their street, and typically what we do is lead them through our prioritization system that we have on here. So we think it'll be great to have that at the forefront of this tool. And what this new tool means is that residents will be able to search. You can see that there's this box up here where if you're a resident, you can enter in your street address in that box. And then once you click enter, or if you're on a mobile device, you can, you can do the use my location feature, and it'll zoom into the address that you entered there. Or you'll be able to click on any road segment, and it'll zoom into that section as well. So that's what you're seeing here is a zoomed in view. And then it'll pull up a box 
So you can see Emerald Parkway, we're at City Hall. It's um, a priority one street. Sorry, my pointer kind of goes in and out. So it's a priority one street. So that's a really good feature that'll, that residents will have at their fingertips and they'll be able to look up the priority of any street that they're interested in. So that's a good educational, uh, informative tool that the city is going to have on the website. Um, it's a proactive means to communicate that piece of information. So what I just talked about was the focus was on the priorities. Now this is the view that residents will see when they first pull up the web page while we are actively working a snow event. So the the base web page, what you just saw, showing the priorities, that's what'll come up first when we're not in the middle of an event. So if it were up and running today, this is what would come up on the screen. If we were in the middle of a snow event, this is what the web page would look like. So we have another legend up here. Oh, thanks. Now I have to learn how to use a new pointer. Okay. <laughs> So the color coding up here and the line style up here is used to indicate our city cruise activities or our servicing, so the status of our servicing. Um, fleet staff worked very hard over the summer. They installed new GPS units on all of the vehicles and plows that are used in our snow efforts. They also installed sensors on the plows so we can see whether a plow is up or a plow is down. There's sensors on the salt spreaders so we can see, take a look. We have the data as to whether um, that each specific truck is actually spreading salt or not and at what rate. So that's really good data that we'll now have at our fingertips. Um, the data that we're gathering from these GPS units will be used for a lot of different purposes. It'll be used to provide information to residents and then it'll be also used internally to manage all of our resources. So like I said, at upper left screen, there's another legend. So you can see the solid, dark green, thick line indicates that a street was treated less than an hour ago. So within the last hour, it's the brightest green, thickest line. If it was treated between one and six hours ago, that's the narrower green line. And then if it was treated more than six hours ago, then it's a lighter green dash line. So you'll be able to see a visual as to where, the, where we are progress-wise th throughout the city. And then if a street has not been serviced yet, simply because we're not there in terms of our priority, the street shows up as white, light gray background. And then another important feature of this screen is over here to the left, we have an area where we can include timely messages that we want to make sure that we communicate to residents. So for example, in this box, we can include light snows falling, road, roads may be slippery, use caution today. So that information will constantly be changing depending on what we think is important to communicate to our residents at any time during an event. So presumably when we can't get there, uh, because heavy, heavy snow is falling and we have to get to the priority roads, we can put a box up that says we need to hit the priority roads twice. That's yeah. why we're not in your residential right now. Exactly. Those and that's are, the those perfect are, type of communication to put there is those are the calls going back get. over the primary. Everybody up here gets those calls all the time, so yeah. that'll be good. Yeah. Okay. So similar to the priority screens that I went through before, on this activity or this service level screen, you can go up to the top left corner and enter in a specific address, or if you're on a mobile device, you can click the use my location feature, or you can click on a street segment again, and it will bring up this box. You'll be able to see what priority of street it is. You'll be able to see if it was recently plowed and salted, plowed or salted, you know, what activity actually occurred, and then you can see the most recent activity date and time. So residents that have called in saying, hey, I haven't seen a plow on my street, and then we, you know, we'll be able to look up the information, we'll be able to refer, this to this, refer them to this website, and then in the future they'll just be able to go directly to this website to, see, to get information um, about their street. So if you have a mobile uh, device, then do you have a, an app that you download, or do you have to go through the city website on your mobile? It's the same website no matter what so device you go, you're using for a, now. It's not a separate app to just yeah, put in. Yeah, for now, maybe for next year, that'll be a new. Yeah. You might want to think about that. A new tool, yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, what, what we're doing this year is we're rolling this out. We did a lot of research. We took a lot of uh, look at other cities that are doing similar things around the country. We're going to try it out this year, see what feedback we get, see how much usage there is out there, and then we'll tweak and make improvements for next year. So what I just went through was the public side of the tool. I just wanted you all to be aware that there's also additional functionality that we'll be using internally to, that'll help us manage the events. Um, the managers over the events will be able to log in up here in the upper right hand corner. They'll be able to quickly see where we are in terms of progress. So for priority one treated, you can see that we're 73% done. And the only way that we would have been able to get that information in the past was the manager over the snow event had to radio each and every snowplow driver and say, hey, where are you? How far into, the, into your route are you? So it was a very manual process to gather that information. Now they'll be able to go to the website and with the click of a button be able to get that information. So it'll really help us in terms of efficiencies. There's also a lot of reports that I won't go through here, but it'll help us monitor productivity. So we'll be able to determine, you know, whether one route's, you know, being completed faster than other routes. And we'll really be able to um, take a look at how our routes are established and how we're attacking each snow event. We'll also be able to take a look quickly how many plows are on the road at any given time how much salt's being used. Um, if we provide direction to, to plow drivers, hey, you know, don't use any salt right now, we'll be able to determine whether they all complied with that direction and things like that. And then lastly, this is just one more internal tool that will really help us communicate internally between the different divisions and work units that are involved in managing snow events. This is one location where whoever has been designated as the event manager, and we always designate an operations administrator or a crew supervisor at any given time throughout the day, one person is designated as the event manager. And they're responsible for updating the event information on a routine basis throughout the snow event. So they'll be able to enter info, information into this form. What's the weather? Um, how many trucks do we have out on the roads? How many trucks are down and need repair? What's our um, salt inventory, enhanced salt inventory, things like. So we're going to have a very good record of all of the data associated with our snow operations. And then what this does is once the event, man event manager completes this form, it will produce and generate an email that gets automatically distributed to staff throughout the city. Very good. So as you can see, it's going to be a very helpful tool. And we hope that it's useful to the public and council as well. I'm sure it will be. Questions? Um, I think it's a, it's, it looks excellent. Uh, I'm sure you were planning on doing this, but just for my own purposes, I'm going to state it, that um, to communicate through our e-newsletters to all the homeowners associations about this tool and, and also then to all the citizens that happen to be on the e-newsletter, that they could get it directly. Um, because I, I, you know, we need to get the word out yeah. um, uh, about its existence, since we're expecting snow pretty soon. Oh, yeah. I hope not. Yeah, our goal was yeah. to roll this out at the council meeting, and then from here we'll work with Sandra and her team to make sure that the word gets out. Yeah, we need Good. to get it out thank before you. it's done. Okay. Anybody else? No. All right, thank you, Ma Megan. Appreciate one it. other item, Megan, if you could give the update on the additional salt that we're able to acquire this year. We found some more salt? We don't have it yet, but okay. we <laughs> were able to obtain a quote from Car Cargill for the enhanced salt, mm -hmm. which it's you know, the colored salt that you see. So we're hoping to get delivered. We placed the order earlier today, and we're hoping to get delivery sometime soon of a few more thousand tons. Sounds like an arbitrage opportunity to me. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good thing to know that, that we have that salt. In, and actually, it'll put us pretty much where we typically are in order of salt order. So yeah, it was a very good find by the staff to come up with this. Right. Yeah, so at this point we have all of our orders in place. Now it's just a matter of getting the right. trucks on the road to get it here. Good job. Thank you. Okay. Staff. Uh, first, I just wanted to ask Paul to um, give a quick update on Dublin Glick Road. There have been a slight change in some of the things you're going to see in it. So it's an opportunity for him to give a quick update on that. Mm -hmm. yeah, we keep working very um, diligently with the contractor to get this project complete. Uh, the current status is um, working with the contractor and particularly the electrical subcontractor getting the signal operational 
that starting next Monday, uh, the existing signal will come down and a four-way stop condition will go into place uh, for a week period of time. Uh, we've worked this with ODOT and coordinated it. Part of what puts us in this situation is the utility delays and getting all the utilities out of the, the way so the work could progress, uh, especially all the underground work. And now we're in a position to get paving done, but what's holding up the paving is the existing strain poles for the signal and the foundation for the cabinet are out in the paved area uh, where the new turn lanes are going to be. Um, so we will, um, we are working with Shawnee Hills to have law enforcement officers out there during the peak hours. They're gonna be there anyhow because paving work will start also the first of next week. So while this four-way stop condition is in place, we'll also have the paving contractor working. Uh, they're expected to be finished up uh, hopefully within a week uh, to a week and a half. And then the signal after we go through the burn test um, we will actually put it in operation, um, we're expecting Tuesday, November uh, 18th uh, is where we're at. Um, will they have uh, officers out there for the early morning hour rush? Yes. Like yep. at 7? Yeah, six. they've typically been out there at 7 o'clock because that's uh, when they've been starting work. And now with the time change, it'll be light earlier. Um, a lot of it is just getting temperatures in order to pave. We like 40 degrees and rising to put asphalt down. Yeah, because that'd be total chaos if it was a four-way stop without a police officer. Correct. Have cars Typically, there's been two officers out there working the intersection uh, while there's been a lot of activity going on. The other thing that we're going to do is we are going to use the blinker stop signs. We have two in stock. We are working to get two more acquired. And then we also have the blinker stop ahead signs. And then additionally, we'll use changeable message boards to alert folks before they get to the intersection of this change condition. So. Uh, but our goal is to get the project paved out, get it striped, and presently the completion date's the 26th of November, which is the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. Great. So we're so working at, towards at peak that. hours, will, will they actually be directing traffic? Um, they will actually let the four-way stop run. If for some reason it starts to get congested, they will step in and clear out a particular leg. It'll get congested. Yeah. I mean, it already has through the last three months. So, yeah. okay. but they actually, the, the police officers out on the job have done a great job of, of managing traffic and most importantly, keeping it safe for both motorists and the construction workers. That's very good. Goal Any other questions? One. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Uh, the only other item I have is um, there have been some questions over the last few days with regard to a pedestrian tunnel location at John Shields Riverside Drive intersection. Uh, we provided information to council where we've had some discussions at workshops and in other settings but in going back through and, and researching the information that we had we couldn't find where there was a final discussion specific to the tunnel and a decision or direction given by council so uh, the information is also provided in a hard copy at your desk this evening and then if if you wanted to schedule a time frame that we could have the discussion to follow up uh, we can do so at your direction I appreciate the information, but at least for me, it's a moot point. It's it's not in the it's not in the plans. I think we dismissed that as an option many some time ago. No, that's what she's saying. Well, the final decision about it. Yeah, I mean, we we currently have it in the plans, and the discussion that we had about oh, not that. having a tunnel was that? at no. yeah, it wasn't I was at Dale Drive, and it's in it's in the information. The one workshop we had specific discussion on the capital projects and one that was mentioned was the pedestrian tunnel. The, the plans are being done right now. That's correct. And this is in those plans? Correct. Well, then we do need to talk about it. Yeah. I, I, I totally I totally missed that. Perhaps we should read everything that's at yes, our that's desk. that's a great idea. And then um, maybe at our next meeting. We can schedule time. OK. Again. Is that good with everybody? Yeah. All right, then. OK, what else? thank you. That's it. All right. Uh, Council committee reports, uh, Amy. P and Z rep. Okay. Um, last Thursday, Planning Commission met, meeting again this Thursday, Thursday after that. Um, I'm not bitter about lots of meetings or anything, but um, anyway, we talked about the code and we um, approved the um, amendments to the code. There's a number of issues that we discussed, um, a lot of housekeeping issues. Um, Planning Commission continues to have some very, very um, strenuous objections and questions, I should say, um, to Bridge Street. Um, among them are the traffic, and I noticed back in our 
planning room that we actually do have a Bridge Street traffic study. I'm going to take this home and read it thoroughly. And um, if I think it is of value, I will ask staff to perhaps distribute this to, the, or maybe the executive summary to the Planning Commission, um, because we've talked about traffic a lot. Um, they're concerned with, with traffic in so much as we are putting in apartments and that we have so many apartments going in and perhaps not enough of the other stuff, the office, the restaurant, the shopping, and that um, you know the Bridge Street District will just turn, up, turn out to be a huge area of apartments and not much else. And they're concerned that we are getting these apartment projects in and they don't contain the mix of things that, um, that they believe are really important to make the district work. So that was um, some of the discussion that we had uh, about the code and, and um, I think staff's probably going to be bringing forward um, the code for, for us and I'm guessing that they'll have a pretty detailed memo. I asked that staff prepare a memo just talking about the discussion points that Planning Commission had and um, but we did um, get the code passed and it is on its way to Council. So do you want me to go with my regular roundtable stuff or are we going to come back around? We'll come back for that. Okay. Okay. Thank can, you. Can I just follow sure, up with a absolutely. question to Marcia sure. on, on the issue that uh, Amy raised. Uh, what is it that we can do? Because really the Bridge Street corridor is intended to be more of a, a live work play area. You know, it's a, it was almost like an entertainment district with living quarters. Um, what is it that we can do to be generating the interest by people to build the buildings with retail, restaurants, entertainment, and businesses in them? Well, I think the, the one thing that we, we have seen a lot of interest um, in the Crawford Hoying development, I forget the, the square footage that they have, but it's um, retail and there's a restaurant space there. There have been some other developers that are looking at potential sites and part of their development will include um, retail and restaurants in their development. The one thing that, that has come up in the past over with the studies and all of the speakers that we had early on is the fact that you have to have certain level of density and critical mass in order for the retail to work and so that's part of what's being evaluated as projects come in and what makes sense to have retail and where it makes sense to have it so that it does get the traffic that it needs and it is in a location that people want to visit so I think I think we have had a lot of interest um, in that type of development and as as we have projects coming forward you'll begin to see more of the the mixed use in those developments thank you thank you anything else Rick administrative committee yeah just one thing uh, quickly here Mike um, as you know we continue to uh, work with our uh, consultant with respect to identifying uh, candidates for city manager and uh, notice that uh, uh, and, and we all know it's uh, a relatively fluid um, exercise um, and was reviewing our city manager profile and schedule and I just wanted to make a correction to that uh, that on November 14 and 15 of this, this year uh, council we will meet but uh, council to continue review of candidates and interest with search consultant uh, we are hoping um, potentially uh, on November 20th and 21st those will be potential interviews uh, with council and December sometime we ideally would like to finalize our selection and make an appointment so I just want to make that clarification because our uh, we put together the profile back in August and uh, as we knew back then uh, it's a dynamic situation and it does change as we go on so I just want to clarify that thank you now on the 20th uh, our calendar doesn't show uh, meeting so could you tell me the time on the 20th yes that's at uh, 6 o'clock on the 20th uh, participating mm -hmm. six to nine and then we'll uh, uh, send out a updated calendar uh, could we, yeah I'm wondering if we could have a sheet in the front or something of just the city manager <laughs> dates sure, and times that. and locations yeah. of these and so and, there and what Ann's doing and, and, and I know she's because uh, <laughs> yeah, I call her you know quite a bit saying okay can we block out these days so our, a lot of our calendars just simply blocking out them 
potential dates for things. Uh, and a lot of those dates have not been firmed up, but we've all asked each other to kind of you know, identify some days and dates and times where we could all be available if, if need be. So I will get with Ann and we'll update the calendar. We've had to move some of the times around just to, uh, to reflect work schedules and such. So yes, it has been very fluid. Yes, it has. Yep. So thank you. Okay. Okay. All right, uh, John, anything on community development? No, uh, Mayor, it appears that about everything is community development and everybody's involved in it at a high level. So with all the new kind of um, developments and projects we have, so. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Lee, finance? Yes, we, uh, as you know, in November we have a lot of finance meetings, so uh, be sure to have on your calendar this week, November 5th at 6.30, we have our first budget here, a meeting. Uh, November 12th at 5.30 will be our cost study review, um, and at 6.30 we'll go into our second budget meeting. And then on November 24th at 5 o'clock is the hotel motel grant review process. So those are all on our what today is a green calendar, mm -hmm. <laughs> something different in two days. We'll have, we'll um, color. But um, I've heard from a couple people that were not able to attend uh, a specific meeting or coming in at a different time than we're starting, but that's fine. If any of the rest of you haven't communicated with me about your schedules needing to be um, arriving at different hours than our start times, I'd appreciate you sharing an email with me on that. Thank you. Thank you. Amy, anything for public service? No. Okay. Any other reports? Arts Council, Board of Education, Morpsey, US 33. Tim, you and I need to talk about 33 off, offline. Yeah, I agree. I, I see where the next meeting is December 3rd, and I want to talk to you and, and perhaps Marcia about the most efficient way of handling that. Good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Council Roundtable. Greg? Thanks, Mayor. Uh, just real quick, Marsha, on two, yeah, there were two different memos that dealt with construction and, and trans the major construction projects in our packets. The Transportation Committee Advisory, Communication Advisory Committee, do they meet or are they just sort of a group that's out there that's kept in contact? They, they will meet. They've not met yet. We've just established the group. I don't know if there's any times that are scheduled yet or not, but they will be having uh, meetings and discussions. Right. Community relations will be working with engineering and uh, Megan to discuss first steps with that group. Um, we will have an organizational meeting and then work with them to determine our game plan for 2015. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. if, if, if I might just say, you know, they continue to send emails about no communication and the bridge is going to be closed and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and so I don't know when this committee is meeting, but we need to get this oh, going. We, we hope in the next two weeks. Um, because yeah. this, they're just, they're, they themselves and even some of the people you have on this committee are giving out erroneous information to the public. And it's really discouraging, frankly, because we at City Council love it, haven't even been given the final plan on but what we we're doing about the roads. Doing, yeah. Well, we're not going to know that until we get the final plans completed as I understand it which will be in December sometime or by we the end were told of November yeah I mean we're currently at 60 percent we expect to have an additional update by the end of this month that we can provide additional information there is a memo in this in this packet uh, that talks about some of the the contracting methods that we're we're looking at so we will continue to provide updates to council yeah I, you know I was going to bring that up at round tables but since it's already here um, my understanding was also, Marcia, that with respect to when you are closer to completed, because we were when you brought it forward before, it was only 40 percent that that council was going to weigh in on some aspects of this construction. So, like, we'd have some options to decide on. Is that still the game plan? Yeah, I mean, part of part of what's in the memo this time talks about different construction methods that we're looking at. So we can provide that update to council, get feedback, so that you have a chance to ask questions as to how these things work. Also, we're hoping that uh, by the end of this month, too, we'll have more information on the different phases of the project and the time frames of as far as how long each phase will take and what we see as the detail within those phases. So, yeah, we hope to bring some information back sometime, I don't know if it will be the end of this month or, or beginning of next month. Well, to Rick's point, he's asking if, if we'll have options. Is council going to make decisions on well, we can Well, we can provide information on the options that we've looked at and make our recommendations. But yeah, we'll take feedback and input from council. Um, and if there are changes or something that, that you 
need additional information on or you are have a different direction than what we're looking at yeah we'll we'll be able to have that I, feedback from I think council. that's council's expectation that we would have the last bite of the apple well I I thought on that memo we had a while back now that the question that was going to be given to council had to do with uh, whether or not we wanted to do certain th elements to it that would reduce the time frame that was, um, that was one aspect you know uh, and this memo here that you're making some reference to on uh, I assume this major transportation construction project update um, you know everything is not recommended not recommended not recommended so um, you know this then there's this very confusing which I am gonna have to remember figure out how to read um, sample that I guess you are recommending um, which has incentives and different things in it uh, that's a little too complicated for me to describe but um, is, I assume that that's what is a discussion for a council yeah and, and a lot of that information it's it's looking at instead of just bidding for the lowest price you look at price and time and and things like the 24-hour construction or extended construction right. periods go into things like this so I mean we are looking at ways to accelerate the project and also from an engineering standpoint what makes sense from the constructability as well as safety issues so we will be able to have more information to provide council and maybe the December meeting that will be able to, to provide a, a, a detailed discussion and update. Yeah, that was my expectation that we would have some options with respect to cost, time. Also, I thought the, this task force would somehow tie into that with respect to here's the information that, that they would be ambassadors to help us to get the word out. Also, uh, to get some comments back from them as to affecting of business that sort of thing so yeah and we all kind of tied together in a way. yeah and we will use them heavily to get information out and also to provide us with information as to what they're hearing so that we can address the issues yeah okay. yeah I, I want to make clear that my understanding was that that group would be really used in the marketing uh, of you know whatever the plans are and That's the right, the uh, the different road uh, options and those kind of things but not in the decision about what we're going to oh, no, do no, no. right their timing or anything no no of course not but they would also maybe be of some value to us as to what's going on in their their areas as long as well, and that's well, that's, that's what's too. problematic to me is that if these are the folks that are being negative and spreading erroneous information you know I'm, I'm not sure how we you know get them on the team so to speak you know this is this is really exciting and it's going to be really great we are going to have some headaches while we're going through it <coughs> we need to be really positive I, I don't know how these group these people were selected but uh, it's, uh, yeah. would you include um, Marcia the or could you include a map that sort of outlines for us where the detours would be because if we close one intersection I think it's important to know where that traffic is going sure. to go and if it's just going to you know, move the headache in a different place could, could and I know that's not directly related to, to this waiting and all that stuff in this memo but could you give us an idea of you know a map there will be detour signs here that send you up France Road or across Hayden Run or what whatever it is yeah we'll, we'll be able to provide what what the uh, proposed detour routes are and time frames associated with those well the formal detours and then also sort of the informal because those of us who know the city well will find mm -hmm. other ways and I think that's important too so people understand that we have a grid that we can <coughs> rely on to get people to and from because I've told had conversations with people I'm like well you know Emerald Parkway is going to be open oh oh it will be open by then won't it oh that'll help you know and so it's right. it's a matter of people you know thinking about John Shields that'll be a new road that's also mm -hmm. part of the marketing piece I think Marilee's absolutely speaking to. absolutely well it's clear it's high on council's priority list so you you're, I think we, we talk about it and work on it every day I know yeah. <laughs> we hear about it every day it's too high on so the thank number you. of phone calls I get too so <laughs> yeah under the better please okay all right anything else that's it Amy? thank you okay um one thing I wanted to um thank Paul and our um engineering department for the multi-use path connection on Shire Rings Road um, for about the past year there's been this maybe eight foot 
section of path that's been out and people in Ballantry have not been able to use that path that they were really excited about and um, gosh probably a couple weeks ago the path got completed the angels sang I actually got a phone call I can't believe I'm gonna be able to walk up very excited so thank you very much um, that was something that I was getting a lot of phone calls and questions about and I very much appreciate that um, that that was completed and then also with regard to Dublin Road South I was curious um, where we were um, in terms of with our acquisition and are we going to court or are we still working well we're, we're, we did file on the one remaining property uh, we have had continued discussions with with the property owner but we are moving forward with the um, utility work the trimming I saw that and the the poles will be relocated and so we'll continue on on the path to be ready to do the construction next year um, and the hope is that we will have the one final property owner resolved by the time the construction is initiated perfect thank you very much that's all I have mayor thank you thank you Marilee um, the memo that you have items of interest um, the completion of Emerald Parkway and the party on December first uh, I just wanted to um, make sure that we're inviting all former council members because from day one of Emerald Parkway all ten phases or whatever phase we're in eight really um, you know all of those council members in the past have been involved in that so I'm hoping that uh, they will all get invitations and that'll be a little warmer than this evening um, and then this memo on the proposed bridge and high valley parking I, this was also very confusing I'm wondering if someone could speak to what is it that is our role in this uh, since it's a private sector issue um, well I'll let Dana discuss the details but basically the agreement that was um, executed previously said that it's it's Bry High and their group their responsibility they can they can come back at a later point in time and charge a fee and so they're currently in that process of looking at that they've requested the city's participation and, it, and at this point our recommendation would be that the city not participate that they look at the fees and with that I'll let well, we know. have participated with a lot of improvements thank you yeah I, I really have nothing to add to that I think Marcia captured it um, succinctly uh, they're asking for some subsidy from the city our recommendation is not at this time should we do that uh, they'd, they'd like to impose a, a two dollar fee but that would include with the city's participation we've asked them to go back and look at that again should it be slightly more than that without the city's participation and so forth and for the memo they came back with um, uh, that that they felt that that would not work so our recommendation is that uh, we would not participate but we wanted to make sure that was in front of you before we went back and obviously said something to them so what um, I guess I was surprised I'm sorry it was something in my eye um, I was surprised that they would expect uh, municipal participation in a private sector issue but what is uh, typical of this kind of situation with other cities well and we had met with uh, both the uh, development company and with park ops who was the operator and we asked that very question you know what's your experience and uh, uh, specifically we asked about City of Columbus because you know they went through a recent policy discussion on that significant discussion down in the short north area and actually um, uh, the City of Columbus is not participating in a way of a subsidy in fact there's a permitting process which is somewhat revenue generating to right. them um, and if they are using uh, and they're not allowed to use public uh, parking spaces and the other thing was that if they are taking out metered spaces you know in order to uh, provide the valet where you would pull up and taking away metered spaces they would have to compensate the city for the metered space so uh, from uh, so that we felt that was a um, probably the best benchmark to go off of was was that situation so I guess that I would um, propose so that we don't have to continue having discussions on this that uh, we um, I recommend that we not currently subsidize the parking uh, fee of valet parking fee it structure right now or issue in uh, historic Dublin you, correct you want that in a, in a form of a resolution need, or anything or just uh, I think got the motion is concurrence. Motion. I, need. I need a second, if it is, I second. 
Yeah. Mr. Zerker? Yes. Mr. Reiner? Yes. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Mayor Keenan? Yes. Vice Mayor Gerber? Yes. Ms. Saley? Yes. Mr. Lechleiter? Yes. Thank you. That's all? Thank you. And Dana, I think your recommendation, the amount of effort you put in here in telling them that it was a $3 solution was excellent. So it was right on. I'm sorry they didn't, they didn't accept that. Thank you. Tim? A couple things. Wanted to thank uh, Matt Herman for his update to the baseball and softball field use policy. Um, you know, this, this can't be fun. Um, anyway, <laughs> it, but it's necessary. Um, uh, you know, that's a big part of, um, you know, our recreation services that we provide to the community, and uh, I appreciate it. Um, and also the extent to which it, uh, you know, achieves consistency with what we did with soccer uh, and so forth. So I think that's important. Uh, appreciate that. Also appreciate uh, the report that we got uh, from the events folks uh, regarding the Irish Festival. And I know there's something going on. Well, actually, it's tomorrow night, I think. It is. So uh, they'll give a detailed presentation there. But uh, it looks like it was a, uh, as we all know, a successful Irish Festival. So thank you. Thanks, Tim. John? I really uh, have nothing except for, uh, again, noticing that, you know, we have been rated the number one best suburb in America, <coughs> and then, again, in this one, we were in the top 50 best suburbs in America by Business Insider. So congratulations to the staff and everybody involved. Thank you. Thanks, John. Rick? Nothing more. Uh, we talked about the, uh, the construction, so that's, that's all. Very good. Well, we have numerous meetings throughout November. Uh, I count them. There's... It's unbelievable the agenda, the uh, schedule that we're going to have to keep here, but uh, it's all part of the job. So everybody stay tuned. And as, as Rick said, some of these are fluid, so we'll, uh, we'll keep on top of that. Other than that, uh, we'll stand adjourned.